Hi guys, it's Vieko here. So today I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is we have finally got to see a decisive game in the World Chess Championship. The bad news is it is not the World Chess Championship we all hoped for, but rather the female World Chess Championship that is currently being held in the shadow of the Carson Caruana match. So uh, the World Chess, the female World Chess Championship was held as a six round knockout tournament and currently there are only two survivors left, uh, Katrina Lanyo and Zhu Wenjun. I'm sorry for horribly mispronouncing that, uh, I'm bad with Chinese names, no offense to anybody. And uh, they are currently play playing a four game uh, final match and today we are going to take a look at game two which featured a very brilliant endgame technique by Lanyo. So let's take a look what happened here. The knight f3 was played, the right the opening by Lanyo, and Wenjun played knight f6. g3, d5, bishop g2, c5, and now castling. The, the reverse king side fianchetto is on the board. Knight c6 was played, and here white has a choice. He can play d3, which would lead to some sort of reverse king's indian. I will just flip the board to show you. So this is after e5, this is the classical king's indian, where white has tempo up. And uh, he can choose between the move played in the game, he can play d4. And this is some sort of Catalan reverse Grunfeld, depending on Black's reply. And e6 played by Venjun uh, leads to Catalan. But c takes d4 was also played, and after knight takes e5, knight takes b takes c4. Uh, this is a Grunfeld where white is a tempo up. And this might seem like very dangerous. But actually it is debatable how useful this tempo is for white. Uh, I think Wishi Anand played like four games in 2016 with this line and he achieved excellent results. He scored two draws and two wins against world class opposition. So yeah, it's not that bad for black, but okay, e6 is also possible of course. And now c4, uh, undermining the center and going for some sort of Catalan structure. Uh, Dtx c4 was played by Benjun. If you, uh, bishop e7 is more often played, but this is an invitation to Taraj defense. And if you take c takes d5, okay, you can take with the knight probably, but if you take with the e pawn, the e pawn then e takes e takes and then a3 probably or something. And okay, this is the Taraj defense which is currently uh, is disappeared from top level, but because it is a bit dangerous. Uh, a version of an isolated uh, queen side pawn, queen side, uh, isolated queen pawn position. Okay, so d takes c4, and now there are lots of moves available for white. Queen a4 is one, knight e5 is one. There are both theoretical moves where white needs to know what he's doing, obviously, because they're sharp. But d takes c5 is a bit more timid, but not completely without venom. Queen takes, rook takes d1, bishop takes c5, and now knight fd2 was played by Lanyo. And uh, before we uh, get to the idea behind this move, let's take a look what happens after the more natural move, knight bd2. Then you get c3, and b takes c3, and white has a ruined pawn structure. He has three pawn islands and black has two. Okay, he has some piece activity, he has an open b file, but black has a clear target in uh, down this c foil, this is this 3-3 three, three pawn. It is also important to note that here knight a5 defending the pawn doesn't work because knight e5 and you attack it twice and you're taking it and you have excellent position. So knight fd2. The purpose of this move is obvious. First he attacks c4. Secondly you prevent c3 because c3 knight takes c3 is nothing for, for black. Thirdly you uncover this bishop's diagonal and you defend e4. So Knight e4 is another idea, and as we will see, this this actually was played in the game. The only drawback of knight fd2 is this move, which defends the c4 pawn, and now white, white doesn't have a convenient way of recapturing this pawn, because knight e5 is not possible. So white has to play knight a3, and now if black allows knight c4, it's bad for him, so he is more or less forced to take here b takes c3 and now it is time to stop and see what we have achieved so why has white given up the knight to get an isolated pawns well first of all he has the two bishop advantage and the position is somewhat opened 
Second, we will get the B file, which is important. And thirdly, this past C pawn, although it does look strong, is actually not going anywhere, and you will manage to win either that one or create pressure on the B file, or something is bound to happen here. And uh, Castling is played by Juven Jun, and there are some games with Bishop d7, uh, Knight d5 was played by Hare Krishna, and just to illustrate the previous point, c3, Knight b3, Knight c6, and Bishop b3 with Rook ac1 coming, ganging up, up this pawn is good for white. And here Knight e4 was played, and so far the players have been following the game Karaki, between Karakin and Anand from Tata Steel 2018. Uh, Heard Anand played knight takes e4, bishop takes e4, e5, and the thing is more or less transposed. And e5 was played immediately by Venjun. There is something to be said about knight d5 as well. And after bishop d2, as in the game, you have time for b6, rook ac1, and bishop a6, takes, takes, and knight c5, and okay. The evaluation of this position is not clear. Probably black should be fine but i think white has all the fun here so okay it needs further analysis and testing in any case e5 was played here and now bishop d2 uh, 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 uh Kara can play something with bishop b2 but okay bishop d2 is pressuring the knight first and only then going for the e5 pawn and the point is that black can't reinforce the knight with b6 because then you get knight takes, g takes, and uh, bishop takes a8, a free rookie, and we all like free rooks. So that's like the sub subtlety here. Knight e4, bishop e4, c6, bishop c3, and here actually, if rook e8, we would be back to Karakin Anand game, and after rook ab1, this illustrates the point of the opening, because this b file is under pressure, h6, and here uh, Anand managed to hold a draw from this position, although I think most of us would rather play white in this structure. Then Jun deviated from that game and she played bishop e6, and Wajo simply decided, I mean simply, she decided to take with bishop takes c6, the problem is that after rook b1, knight d4, well, let's say takes, 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 and rook d8, you take here, and if you take here, you get in something like f5, and you are suddenly a bit a bit struggling because if you play bishop f3, rook c8, and this pawn might march. So yeah, I think bishop c6 is a best move, and it although it looks like a black uh, like a draw for it's not. So b takes c6, uh, bishop takes c5, and this position looks harmless, but. And it seems that Juven Jun was of the same opinion, because I will now show you a tweet uh, by Ugra Chess, the official organizer of the championship. And they say that Katrina Lanyo uh, said at the press conference that her opponent played rather quickly and most probably underestimated the danger. She probably thought she, can, she could draw as she pleases here, but it's not that simple. So why should Y exactly be better here? Well, he does... Uh, he have this kingside pawn majority, he can create some targets, and his bishop actually has more, more scope, because these pawns are severely restricting uh, uh, black bishop. And okay, his rooks are already on the open f squares. And yeah, he can utilize these dark square weaknesses, both by his king later in the game and by his rooks, and potentially by the bishop. And okay, it's not much, objectively, with proper play, the game should be drawn, but white is the one that has some chances of pushing. Rook fd8 played by uh, Venjun, a logical move trying to exchange the rooks. Bishop c3, which is not perhaps the most precise. f3 is probably more circumspect, so to speak, because uh, it rules out bishop f5, because after uh, king f2, bishop c2, rook dc1, it, you attack both the bishop and the pawn behind it, and you win the c4 pawn, and with it probably the game. So after bishop c3, the White could black could have played bishop f5 because now after f3, bishop c2, rook dc1, bishop a4, he has gained control of the d file and the c4 pawn is not actually hanging, so that's like the point of of the play. But yeah, 
as, as we we already seen, uh, Wen Jun was playing rather fast here, and she probably thought she is okay. So f6 was played here, f3, king f7, king f2, takes, takes, bishop b8, and here we see another advantage of these double pawns. By the way, if you're wondering why everything is already marked, I already this is my second take on this video because on the first take I left the tweet open in the middle in the middle of the of the video, so no no comment on that. I had to do everything I knew, which is probably fortunate because I re revised some lines. But okay, rook b8 was played, and this pawns now the, the a2 pawn, which looks silly, actually covers b3 square, which is very important in this position. And the, the black rook can't penetrate on the b file, and meanwhile white has d file, which is slightly more more uh, useful for him, especially later in the game. So g4 was played, trying to open up the king side. C5, well. This could be debated, but I think Black sooner or later has to play this move because it will prevent sorry it will prevent uh, King D4 pe penetration in the future, and uh, White is unable to attack this pawn with either the rook or the bishop, so he it is safe on the on the dark square. Perhaps you can go with it without it, but I think sooner or later you have to push it when the king comes to e3 because you will either have to prevent it with in this way or to keep the rook on d file which as we will see is not not something that is always possible so c5 h4 going for the g5 break trying to weaken this g7 target h6 a4 pushing on the other side king e7 just waiting a5 rook b7 rook g1 rook d7 this is probably the first imprecision you could have played something like king d6, g5, h takes, h takes, rook f7, takes, takes, and debate that after king e3, f5, this position is better for you with the king on d6 and rook on f7 than the one that arose in the game. Okay, but it's not easy to evaluate and probably you was under impression there is nothing threatening here. Rook d7 was played, g5, h takes, h takes, king f7, G takes, G takes, and now rook h1, uh, trying to get the king to g7, why not, king g7, okay, maybe you don't need to do that, maybe you can go play f5, and now after, let's say, king e3, you go king e7, and, okay, the problem is that now without the king on d6, you can play bishop e5, which is arguably slightly more comfortable for white, but still, this is very much defensible. King g7, rook b1, king f7, rook b5, attacking the c5 weakness, rook c7 defending the weakness, rook b8. So this is ideal for white, and as he can move to the left, move to the right, probe black, and wait for a mistake. Without the, the serious mistake from black, this is not possible to win, but as they say, this is the play on one goal in this endgame. Rook e7, rook e8, and now king g6. Rook f8 attacking the f6 pawn, okay, uh, rook f7 defending it, rook g8, and now the first real mistake, uh, king h7. This is going towards the c5 pawn, uh, actually with this way, and uh, the, the, the best defensive move was rook g7, and now after let's say rook e8, uh, you can't go rook, this, uh, rook here because now this is... Uh, why exactly? I forgot, sorry. Yeah, rook d7 is now possible, and now the rook c8, you have rook d3. Okay, I forgot to check this. Sorry, that's my bad. But yeah, there must be some reason. Yeah. Ah, I'm confused now. Okay, but yeah, I, I should probably mention this endgame. Everybody knows how my endgame technique is bad, and I will actually link other analysis from stronger players as soon as they appear. So as far as I have seen, nobody has analyzed this game yet. So, yeah, it is hard for the pioneers. I actually, just let me check. So rook f7, rook g8 check, rook g7. But why, why don't you play rook d8 here? And now rook d7. And now rook c7, rook d3. And does that work in the game as well? I guess we will see now. I forgot to check that, sorry. So rook g8, king h7, rook d8 now. 
And now I'm curious why ah now rook d7 you get what rook e8 and you dislodge the bishop and if bishop goes somewhere yeah how ah, ah that's the difference yeah now I understand sorry so yeah now the uh, apart from c5 the f6 is also vulnerable so there are two weaknesses in the position and uh, black uh, with the king on on h7 black can hold them both so rook d6 once again, you, you you either lose the f pawn or you lose the c pawn, and Black decides to give up the c pawn with King g6, Rook d6, Rook e7, Rook c6, Rook f7, and Rook takes c5. Now Black is close to being lost, and I'm not sure whether the evaluation is definite or not. But in practical game, it is very hard to defend, and you relatively quickly collapse from here. So Rook d7 was played, Rook c6 f5 king e3 now comes the king rook e7 rook e4 you would want to play rook d4 here but the problem is that this allows bishop d7 and now you can play rook f6 here and your e pawn is also attacked and this exchange is probably favorable for black because it has his, his position and yeah this is fine for him most probably but rook e4 now the point is that with rook d7 is met by rook f6 check and this is good. So let's say you move somewhere, and e3, and you're you're all tight. But instead of rook d7, rook e8 was probably more more resilient, because now a6 doesn't work. You get rook c8 and rook d6, uh, king e7, and after bishop b4, which looks threatening, you have c3, and you actually don't have a very good discovery. Let's say rook c8, rook uh, king f7 takes 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 and takes here and this is drawn so yeah you can't hurry and if you play uh, rook c7 after rook e8 then you get rook e7 back and yeah rook c5 now king e8 and it's hard for white to make some progress not sure what the move is because if you play a6 immediately then you shouldn't hurry with this, but just to illustrate, you get bishop d7 attacking the e pawn, e3, king, uh, rook e6 attacking the a pawn, bishop a5, and uh, bishop c8. And yeah, you. I think if black even if black manages to exchange this for this, okay, these pawns will look threatening, but he can he probably has enough resources for a draw but it's not so clear to evaluate this and yeah you was under serious pressure here so good luck finding that and evaluating this rook d7 this was it, probably the losing moment of the game rook c5 intending to get to here okay you could have probably also played a6 immediately and after king e7 king g5 this is very beautiful because now uh, if you get King f7, obviously rook d6, bishop b4 is nothing. So uh, king f7, f4, king e7, bishop b4, king f7, a3. And the uh, white, the black is in Tsuktsuang now. <laughs> because, okay, let's say rook d8, rook c7, rook d7, rook b7, you can't move any of the pieces. If you take here, you obviously don't want to take here. You can't move the bishop. Uh, you, you are having trouble with moving the king here. And uh, yeah, so very much. Let's say if you play King G7, then you get get here, and you're once again <laughs> in in trouble. So yeah, White is breaking through, and this Rook is MVP of the game here. So and if you play King E8, then sorry, if you if you play King Ah shit. If you play king e8, then king f6 is more or less winning on the spot. So that was probably more direct, but I think rook c5 is also winning. Because uh, now black can't prevent a6, because rook d6, king e5, rook d7, a6. And now uh, rook e7, king here, rook d7, king c6. And you're going to break through sooner or later. This this is probably fine for winning for for white. Although black can resist still. But here after rook d8, this is more or less over immediately because rook b5, rook d7, a6, and now white gets his ideal setup with rook on b7 sooner or later. Uh, let's say after rook e7, 
bishop b4, rook d7, rook b7. There is nothing better than c3 probably, and bishop takes yeah, king e8, a3, bishop c4, e3, and this is probably just a losing endgame for, for, for black, most probably. But okay, king g6 loses more or less on the spot, and after king e5, as they say, the, mat the rest is a matter of technique, because now Blackie doesn't even have rook d5, his bishop is hanging, rook b7 is coming, and the activity of white pieces uh, with the extra pawn and the a6 uh, pawn is just too much. So, uh, rook e7 was played, rook b7, rook e8, rook uh, takes a7, bishop f7 check, king d4, rook takes a4, preserving the pawn, rook e6, uh, king c5, Bishop e8, uh, rook g7 check, king h6, a7 was played, rook a6, now rook e7 was the simplest move, uh, obviously black can't take here because this is just just winning for, for white, no doubt about that, rook c6, king b4, rook c8, rook b7, oh, there was this cute little trick, rook takes, rook takes, bishop here, bishop here and uh, rook here and this, and you take the c4 pawn and march with the king to b7. So, but okay, rook b7 is also more pragmatic. Rook a8, rook b8, bishop c6, and now the winning move, rook b6, pinning the bishop. And if rook c8, you either promote, or more precisely, you take here, and you promote, and you're a queen, for, uh, and a bishop for a rook, and yeah, this is, I think, doesn't require any subsequent comment. So yeah, that was the game. It was a very beautiful game, I think. Uh, lots of difficult variations, very difficult endgame. I don't claim I exhausted all possible resources here and that my analysis is 100% accurate, but I think I have managed to uncover some finer points. And yeah, as I have said, I will link the analysis most probably by Chesscom once it appears. And yeah, in the mean, if you like the video, you're very welcome to subscribe to the channel or to watch my two videos uh, on the right, the left hand side of the screen. And yeah, that's all for, for today. I wanted to show this game uh, during the rest day. And tomorrow we're back with the main dish, game nine of the World Chess Championship between Magnus Carlsen and Fabiano Caruana. So stay tuned and see you soon. Goodbye.